Amen. Well, good morning, Life Church. I'm glad that you're with us this morning. If we don't know one another, my name is James Sharp. I'm one of the elders here, and it's my joy to open God's Word with you this morning. Brittany mentioned we're in the Gospel of Mark, so I hope you have a Bible with you or a way to get the Bible in front of your face. We're in Mark 12 today, and so go ahead and find that. I'll meet you there in just a moment. We started in the Gospel of Mark in January of this year. Um, Lord willing, we'll finish it in February of next year with a little break coming up for the Advent season, Uh, but we're near the end, Mark 12. We're kind of turning the corner towards home in this story in which Mark reveals to us the glory of our Savior Jesus, the servant king. And so I'm excited for what we get to jump into together this morning. Um, I wanted to start this morning really with an argument I have a claim that I hope to support and to substantiate in our time together today, a claim that I believe Jesus supports and substantiates in the passage that we're going to study today. And I I arrived at this argument by studying God's word and by reading the writings of several ancient Christians, Christians who are now deceased and gone to be with the Lord. And the theme of those writings Um, it really convicted me. Honestly, it was a little bit uncomfortable at first even, Uh, but I come to believe that that discomfort was a gift from God, and I wonder if you might feel the same way before we're done this morning. So let me start by reading from some of these writings that I'm talking about, and then I'll tell you the point that I intend to argue today. Let's begin with Charles Spurgeon. Spurgeon was a famous British pastor of the 19th century He once said this, he who does not prepare for death is more than an ordinary fool, he is a madman. He who does not prepare for death is more than an ordinary fool, he is a madman. Another time, Spurgeon added, he said, the best moment of a Christian's life is his last one, because it, that moment, is the one that is nearest heaven. A Puritan from a few hundred years before Spurgeon, Thomas Watson, he wrote, death is the funeral of all of our sorrows. Another Puritan, John Bunyan, he said, death is but a passage out of a prison into a palace. And then still another Puritan, Richard Sibbs, he wrote, death is not now the death of me, but death will be the death of my misery. The death of my sins. It will be the death of my corruptions. But death will be my birthday in regard of happiness. One more Puritan, William Gurnall. Let thy hope of heaven master thy fear of death. Why shouldest be afraid to die who hopest to live by dying? And then I'll conclude with a slightly more modern voice. This is C.S. Lewis about 100 years ago. He said, has this world been so kind to you that you would leave it with regret? If we really believe that home is elsewhere and that this life is a wandering to find home, why should we not look forward to the arrival? Now, I could go on and on here, but I hope you see the theme of these statements. And in light of that theme, here's my argument today. As Christians today in this culture, we do not think about or long for death nearly enough. And that reveals a deficiency in the way we've been discipled. As Christians today, In this culture, we do not think about or long for death nearly enough. And that reveals a deficiency in the way we have been discipled. Or perhaps I could say that a different way. Our failure to think about and long for death, it reveals that we've been discipled by the world and And by the American dream as much as we've been discipled by Jesus. It reveals that our discipleship, it's too short-sighted and too worldly. And as a result, we just don't think about death enough and we don't 
long for death enough. Now, to be clear, I'm not talking about the kind of longing for death that is the result of a mental illness or a psychological disorder. I'm not talking about the kind of longing for death that would potentially lead someone to take his or her own life. Rather, I'm talking about the kind of view of life and death and the kind of longing for death that led the Apostle Paul to write things like this. In Philippians chapter 1, he said, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Right? I'm talking about the perspective on death that sees death in Christ as gain and not loss. Instinctively, we think of death as loss. But to the Christian, it's otherwise. It is gain. And our failure to really embrace that, it reveals something about us. It was the reformer, John Calvin, who wrote, we may positively state that nobody has made any progress in the school of Christ unless he cheerfully looks forward towards the day of his death and towards the day of the final resurrection. What Calvin's saying there is that a mark of Christian maturity is a looking forward to and a longing for death and resurrection. And the flip side of that then would also be true, right? Any kind of fear of death or dread regarding death or even just like an indifference toward it, that would be a mark of Christian immaturity. Right? And so as you sit here today, right, you're either, all of us are always either growing or sliding backwards in our walk with the Lord. It's impossible to stand still. We're moving ahead or we're sliding backward. And one of the ways that we can assess that is by asking ourselves, how cheerfully and how often do we contemplate our certain death? Or the opposite. How does our life reveal a tragic and cheerful love for the world and for the things of the world? In Mark 12, Jesus encounters a group of men who also love the world. They don't think about death with cheerful gladness, but Jesus' interaction with these men, it does lay down for us the ground of our hope in death. It lays down the foundation of our hope in future glory, come what may in this life. And so these are truths in Mark 12 today that we need to disciple us. And we find in this passage a hope that we need to endure. Let's see that now. Let's read God's word. Mark 12, today we're in verses 18 through 27. Mark writes this. And Sadducees came to him, came to Jesus. Sadducees, who say that there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife, but leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife, and when he died, left no offspring. And the second took her and died, leaving no offspring. And the third, likewise. And the seven left no offspring. Last of all, the woman died. In the resurrection, when they rise again, whose wife will she be? For the seven had her as wife. Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason you are wrong? Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses and the passage about the bush, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. Church, this is God's word for us this morning. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. In Mark 12, we are in the final days of Jesus' life, right? This 
interaction that Jesus has with the Sadducees. It happens most likely on Holy Tuesday. So we're dealing with about 48 hours before Jesus will be in the Garden of Gethsemane, betrayed by Judas, arrested by the high priest's men. We're about 72 hours before Jesus is crucified on the cross. And in these last hours of Jesus' life, like his enemies are circling, right? They're ready to pounce. They're ready to attack. And that's what the conversation that Jesus has here with the Sadducees amounts to, right? This is an attack. The Sadducees come and they try to trap Jesus in his words, much the same way that we saw the Herodians and the Pharisees attack Jesus last week. Who are the Sadducees? Sometimes it can seem like the people who are around Jesus in the gospel are really just like extras in a movie and that their identity doesn't really matter. But this is a case where the, the Sadducees' identity, it actually does matter. It plays a real role in this story. So let's start by thinking about who these men are. Who are the Sadducees? The Sadducees were, at the time of Jesus, a small but significant and influential and powerful group of spiritual leaders. They were wealthy, generally. They were well-connected. They were the movers and shakers of first century Palestine, and they were powerful politically and religiously. When scholars write about the Sadducees today, they talk about three distinct ideas that the Sadducees held on to that kind of distinguished them from other political and spiritual leaders in Israel at the time of Jesus. First, the Sadducees, they didn't believe that the Old Testament prophets or the Old Testament writings were the inspired word of God. They believed that the only inspired word of God were the first five books of the Old Testament, what they would have called Torah, which many Christians today refer to as the Pentateuch. But they looked to just those first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They looked only to those five books as the word of God and they built their entire theology out of those five books and out of nothing more. The second significant thing about the Sadducees is the fact that they didn't believe really in any kind of spiritual realm at all. Especially they didn't believe in angels or in demons. They didn't find those things in their first five books. And so they thought that anything like that was false and untrue. And that way the Sadducees were really the first secularists because they really believed only in things that they could see with their eyes. And then thirdly, the Sadducees, as our passage says here today, the Sadducees didn't believe in a resurrection of the dead. All other Jews in the time of Jesus They believed in a general resurrection of all people at the end of the age. They believed that there would be some sign from heaven and that all people would rise from their graves and that God's people specifically would rise to live in the presence of God and others would live away from God. But the Sadducees, they didn't believe that at all. And our passage even mentions that. You saw it in verse 18. The Sadducees came to him who say that there is no resurrection. And that's really the basis of the Sadducees' attack on Jesus, right? They come to him with what might have been like a first century brain teaser or riddle. They ask the question, if a woman marries seven brothers, one after another, after each one dies, then whose wife will she be in the resurrection? And the context behind that question is an Old Testament law. It's what's called the law of leveret. Marriage, you don't have to remember that later unless you just want to impress your friends and family at lunch, right? A lever, that's, that's a Latin word that means brother-in-law. And the law of lever at marriage stipulated that if a man died and left his widow childless, then his brother, her brother-in-law, her lever, had a moral and legal obligation to marry her. We find that law in Deuteronomy 25. Now remember, Deuteronomy... That's one of the five books that the Sadducees thought were the inspired word of God. And this is what Deuteronomy 25 says. It says, if brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother, her lover, her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother, a lover to her. 
And the first son whom she bears shall succeed to the name of his dead brother, that his name may be blotted out of Israel. And so the concern here is for this childless widow who does not have a man in her family to protect her, to provide for her. And because that's true, there's no way for her dead husband's name to to perpetuate itself, right? To be handed down to future generations in Israel. And so the law of leveret marriage was a way to care for and protect widows in such a situation, right? If a man died, he left no child, no heir, then his brother would step up and marry his wife so that by that brother-in-law, she might have a child who could perpetuate the name of the dead into the future. That's the point of the law of leveret marriage. Now, this is a side note. This Advent season at Life Church, we're going to take a break from the Gospel of Mark just for five weeks. We're going to spend the five Sundays in December studying the lives of the women who are included in the genealogy of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. There are five of them, including Mary, Jesus' mother. And interestingly, in two of those women's lives, the law of lever and marriage plays a really significant role in their story. And so this is something that we'll actually be coming back to in just a few weeks. But here in Mark 12, the Sadducees, what they really want to do is they want to take this law of leveret marriage and score some cheap points against Jesus. They're trying to trap him into saying that either the resurrection can't be true or the law of leveret marriage can't be valid. Right? They hope to make Jesus say that one of the two things is a problem. And they hope that in the process, Jesus will make himself look and sound stupid. Now they're using, here's some more Latin for you this morning, they're using a certain logical fallacy. The fallacy is called reductio ad absurdum. Right? They're reducing the law of leveret marriage to an absurd point in order to try to score their cheap points against Jesus. What they really want Jesus to have to say is, well, of course, that can't happen, right? Of course, this woman can't have seven husbands in the resurrection. Polygamy was against the law in most cases. It was always against the law for women. And so the, these Sadducees, they're hoping to kind of put Jesus into a corner where he can't argue his way out of that corner. They want to make Jesus say, either the resurrection isn't real or the law isn't binding, But Jesus is really amazing. You can't score cheap points off of him. You can't out-argue him. He's the wisest man who's ever lived. He is actually divine wisdom personified. He knows the scriptures better than anyone. He knows God better than anyone. And we can see that in the way that he responds to this Sadducee trap. In verse 24, Mark says, Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason you are wrong? Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. Now this is another side note. This is not the point of the passage. And so it's not my main point to you today. But I want you to know that it is not an overstatement for me to say that virtually all of our problems stem from the fact that we, like the Sadducees, know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. Virtually all of our problems in life owe to the fact that we don't know what God says and we rely on our own strength rather than God's strength. Virtually all of our problems in life owe to the fact that we're trying to live out our own wisdom under our own power rather than submitting our lives to who God has revealed himself to be in his word and the life that God has called us to live in his word and humbly putting ourselves before God, depending on him and his power and in his strength to accomplish through us what he intends to accomplish. We live by our own wisdom and we live under our own strength. We don't know the power of God. We don't know the word of God like the Sadducees. Where God's people have suffered greatly throughout history when they haven't known the word. We see that in the Bible itself. We see that in the history of the church. We still suffer greatly today because we don't really know the word of God. We live in an information age where more information is created every single moment than even existed a hundred years ago. Yet in this information age, we're starved of scripture. And we know so little of who God reveals himself to be. 
Research suggests that Christians in our country have a desperately poor grasp of basic Christian doctrines. I blame the church for that, by the way, not people. But as people, we have failed to know who the Bible really reveals God to be. And we failed to know what the Bible calls God's people to do and to be. Like the Sadducees, we don't know the word. And we also don't know the power of God. At least we don't know it by experience. And that's because we're, we're largely content to live lives that don't require God's power. We're largely content to do things that we can manage on our own. Even if you think about your prayers, you're generally praying about things that you can handle on your own. Or, even more damning, think about your prayerlessness and what that reveals about the way we try to pursue things under our own strength and according to our own wisdom. I think we're much closer to the Sadducees than we really want to admit. That's not the point today. Jesus says, you don't know the scriptures, you don't know the power of God. How do the Sadducees demonstrate those two errors? Well, Jesus starts in verse 25 by pointing to God's power. He says, for when they rise from the dead, not if they rise from the dead, when they rise from the dead, right? Jesus here, he assumes that a future resurrection of all people is a given, that that will be a fact. He says, when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And what Jesus means there is that this future resurrection from the dead of all people, it's more than a mere resuscitation. Right, the resurrection is more than a cold, lifeless body suddenly breathing air again. It's more than a cold, dead heart simply pumping blood again. Right, he says that the resurrection for those who are in Christ involves a glorious transformation so that humans in the resurrection are more like angels than they are not. He's promising that we will be gloriously transformed in the resurrection. He's promising that the sin that so encumbers us in this life will be no more. He's promising by his glorious power that the effects of sin, disease and decay, physical and mental decline, and even death itself, these things will be no more. He's promising by the power of God that we will be like angels, radiant in glory and existing forever, all because of the power of God. The Sadducees, they don't know that power. And then Jesus points to God's word. He goes to a verse of the Old Testament that the Sadducees should have known because it's a verse that came from one of those first five books of the Old Testament, from Exodus chapter three. Look at verse 26, he says, and as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses in the passage about the burning bush, how God spoke to Moses saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living, you are quite wrong. What's Jesus getting at here? Well, he's emphasizing the fact that God does not appear to Moses in the passage about the bush and say, I was the God of Abraham and I was the God of Isaac and I was the God of Jacob. He says, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, even though those patriarchs have been dead for hundreds of years. God remains their God. He still exists in covenant relationship with them. Why? Well, because of the resurrection. To put what Jesus says here a different way, if Abraham and Isaac and Jacob are nothing more than dust, then God cannot now at this moment be their God. God is not the God of that which has ceased to be. He does not make an everlasting covenant with an insect that lasts only an hour. Right, the eternal God does not covenant with creatures that live only 80 years and then are then snuffed out like a candle. No, the eternal God makes covenant with eternal people, with people who will die but then rise one day in the resurrection and enjoy him for all eternity. The Sadducees should have known that and Jesus argues with them because they didn't. He says, God is not the God of the dead, but the living 
Those who are his, though they die, will live forever. Those who are his, though they die, will one day breathe again. God will one day breathe life into their lungs. He will one day cause blood to flow from their lifeless hearts. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and you and me, we will rise if the Lord tarries. And we will be glorified if we're in Christ. We'll be transformed so that we are like the angels if we are in Christ. If we've confessed our sin and our need for a savior, if we've confessed with our mouths that Jesus is Lord, and if we've believed in our hearts that he's risen from the dead, like Paul says in Romans 10, then we will be resurrected to glory. If we're far from him, if we've if we've resisted him in his kindness and his grace, if we've refused to recognize our sin and our need for a savior, if we've not surrendered our lives to him in true faith, we'll be resurrected too, but to eternal torment, not to eternal glory. And in light of that, if you are hearing the sound of my voice this morning, I pray that you would pause and Consider what is at stake in your life. I hope you will consider what is at stake in your life if you resist the gospel. If you're hearing the sound of my voice this morning and you are even uncertain about your eternal fate, I pray that you'll consider what is at stake in your life today. Jesus, he promises a glorious resurrection for his people. And he promises a resurrection to eternal torment for those who have remained in opposition to him. And I pray that we would let the weight of that sit with us today. I pray that we wouldn't just let that reality slip through our fingers this morning. I pray that we would consider the weight of eternity, the gravity of eternity. And then the lives we're living in fact, can we, can we just pause for a moment and sit with that? Can we pause for a moment to let God's spirit probe us in the stillness of this moment and the quiet of this moment? Can we, can we seek the Lord for a moment? Because friends, if you're like me, your mind and your heart are easily consumed by things that will not matter one bit in eternity. And if you're like me, your life is full of pursuits that just won't matter in eternity. So I pray that you'd ask yourself today, what concerns, what burdens, what pursuits dominate your life even though they will fade into oblivion upon the day of the resurrection of the dead? Or what concerns or pursuits or even what people should you give yourself to for the glory of God anticipating your day of resurrection from the dead? May we ask the Lord right now to reveal such things to us. Before we're done, we do need to work through one more thing in this passage like we need to think about what Jesus says about marriage in the resurrection here because it could trip us up and it's incredibly significant that we get this right, I believe. So look back with me at verse 25 where Jesus says this. He says, when they rise from the dead in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. What is Jesus saying about marriage here? And what bearing does that have on the way that we think about people in our lives and our future resurrection in Christ? Those are worthwhile questions, important questions. Most theologians, myself included, believe that what Jesus is saying here is that the institution of human marriage is for this age and this age only. And that the institution of human marriage will not exist in the age to come. Right? That's what most conclude from what Jesus is saying here. Why won't human marriage exist as an institution in the age to come? 
Well, it's because human marriage won't be necessary in the age to come. In this age, the age in which we live and breathe and walk and do the things that the Lord has apportioned for us to do, in this age, according to the Bible, human marriage exists as a living picture of the gospel. Last Sunday afternoon, I stood up front in a wedding venue with two beloved saints from this church family, with many other saints from this church family gathered, and with their closest friends and family gathered also, and I pronounced this young man and this young woman husband and wife. And before I did that, I implored them. I said, friends, your marriage is not about you. Your marriage is about Jesus, because human marriage is intended by God to be a living picture of the gospel. Right, it's intended to be a living portrayal of Christ and his relationship with his bride, the church. Right, human marriage is established by God as an institution to last for a lifetime between one man and one woman because it is to portray in this life that eternal covenant between one Christ and one bride, his church. That's what all human marriage is intended to give testimony to in this age. But in the age to come, we won't need to give testimony to that reality. We won't need to portray that reality because we will see and witness and experience that reality with our very eyes. In the age to come, in the resurrection, we as the saints, the people of God, will be gathered into Christ's perfect, purified bride. And we will be presented to Jesus, our glorious, radiant bridegroom. And we will see him as he is, face to face, and enjoy covenant relationship with him for all eternity, which means the shadow will no longer be necessary in light of the reality. Right? It's like human marriage in this age is the moon. And in a dark night sky, the moon can shine brightly, reflecting the light of the sun. But when the day dawns and the sun comes out, all lesser lights fade. And the glorious, radiant reality of Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, the bridegroom of the church, he will shine so brightly that the institution of human marriage will just be unnecessary. That's why Jesus says in the resurrection, they are neither given, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. And now I know, I have known, and I still know some people who, who are almost discouraged by Jesus' teaching here, right? Perhaps because they love their spouse so dearly that eternity, apart from marriage to their spouse, well, that doesn't really seem like paradise at all. Or I've known others to be discouraged because they've lived years parted from a now deceased spouse, and they long for an eternal reunion with that spouse in heaven. I can understand why if you sit in either of those places, this idea of heaven without your dear husband or dear wife, that can seem like far less than paradise. I really understand that sentiment. But I think that sentiment misses the fullness of what Jesus is saying here. Because Jesus is assuring us that the resurrection will be a fuller experience of life, not a lesser experience of life. What we look forward to in the resurrection, it is more. It is not less. Now, what does that mean for how we will relate to our resurrected spouses or even our children or parents or friends? Well, consider this. I think it's clear from what Jesus says that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob They will be living in the resurrection and they will be no less than themselves. You and I, we will be living in the resurrection and if we are in Christ, in the resurrection, we will be no less than ourselves. Actually, we'll be more fully ourselves because we will be ourselves apart from the stain and scourge of sin. We will be gloriously transformed. We will be as the Lord created us to be. We will be more fully who we are, not less who we are. We will be, our individuality won't be diminished, it will be enhanced. So people will be able to know us more truly, not less truly. Which means that if if you think you love your spouse now, just wait until you meet him in glory. If you think you love your spouse now, just wait until you meet her in glory. 
She will actually be far more lovely to you then than she is now, for then she shall be free from sin. She will be far more lovely to you then because she will have seen the radiant face of Jesus himself and she will have the glory of Jesus on her own face. Right? She will radiate his beauty and his perfection and his glory in every possible way. She will be herself, but she will be more. She will be better She will be perfect. And no, she will not be yours to claim in marriage, for she shall be numbered among the saints who comprise the bride of Christ for all eternity. She shall be Christ's bride and no one else's. But in the age to come, she shall still be yours to love. And your children will still be yours to love. And your parents will still be yours to love. And by the way, your capacity to love will be perfect which means your ability to love them will be fuller and more real because it will no longer be stained by the sinful selfishness that has always stained our love for others in this life. But our love for others will be purified and fully sanctified by the blood of the Lamb, which means that we know this about our future relationship with husband or wife in the resurrection. It will be far better than any relationship that was or is before the resurrection. The best moment of a Christian's life is his last one because it is the one that is nearest heaven. Death is the funeral of all our sorrows. Death is but a passage out of the prison and into a palace. Do these statements not make just a bit more sense in light of what Jesus teaches here? And can we not, with fuller hearts and deeper conviction, agree that for for Christians, death is gain? I pray the Spirit would teach us to live in light of that. What is coming is so much more glorious and more wonderful and more beautiful than even the greatest today in this life. Therefore, we should ache for death. We should long for resurrection and the day that we see Jesus face to face. In 1 Corinthians... The Apostle Paul, he's quoting from the prophet Isaiah, but he talks briefly about what it will be like when we are gloriously transformed in our resurrected state because of the resurrection of Jesus. And this is how he describes it. He says, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, that is what God has prepared for those who love him. What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, that is what God has prepared for those who love him. In other words, we're going to be ushered into this glorious fulfillment of all of God's promises because of our resurrection. And we cannot even at this moment comprehend it. Right, what no eye has seen, that means to us it is still invisible. What no ear has heard, that means to us it is still inaudible. What no heart has imagined, that means it is incomprehensible. But it is not in doubt. It is certain because of the resurrection. Church, our God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. May we live for him. Pray with me. Father, we praise you for your power over death and over life. We praise you for the perfect life and substitutionary death of Jesus. And we praise you for his resurrection, which vindicated his sacrifice and his suffering. Testifies to us that you have accepted the payment of his blood and his body. 
so that we might know that when we are raised to new life, we will be raised to glory. Father, I pray that there is not one among us today who leaves this place uncertain about that reality that no eye has seen and no ear has heard and no heart has comprehended. I pray that there is not one among us today who leaves this place in doubt or confused or hopeless or broken. And I pray that you might lead all of us to joyfully and steadfastly pursue the life that you've called us to live until you return and until we rise from the grave. Pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.